repeating at verse 4. 1 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, and ending at verse 4. In the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1 and ending at verse 4, a message to the heart. Here beginneth the reading of God's holy word. And the men of Kerjat Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought them into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjat Jerim that the time was long for it was twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. So far the scripture. This book of the Old Testament, according to the scholars, was really originally one book. But as they decided to canonize the Bible or to bring certain books that are acceptable what we call the revelation of the will of God from Genesis to Revelation, they broke it down into 1st and 2nd Samuel. The books of Samuel and Kings are really called the books of kingdoms, where it talks about the reign of kings, the kingdoms of certain kings, the purpose, the activities of these kingdoms. But the purpose of these Old Testament historical books really comes to give us instructions. As the Bible says in Romans 15 and 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. These, these historical events, these chronicles are written so that we could have warnings, instructions, encouragement, how to serve God and to love him better. Tell somebody I want to love him better. More specifically, this particular book focuses on the activities of a very outstanding man by the name of Samuel. He had a very, very powerful administration. He ruled as judge and prophet. He also brought in two kingship. He also brought in Saul and David. He brought in the first two kings of the kings of Israel. This particular book tells us of a time period when the spiritual leadership was in trouble. And if there's anything that we are suffering from as a church with all the fantastic churches, with all the wonderful carpets and pews, there's a dearth in the land for clear, profound, decisive spiritual leadership. And the spiritual leadership was high that even though Eli could reproduce himself in Samuel, he could not discipline his two sons. He allowed Ophni and Fahinas to do anything they wanted to do and then go in the temple and officiate. And when people look at sloppy leadership, they live sloppy lives. So here, discouragement had taken hold of the nation of Israel. The people's hearts were weak. Fahinas went in and Hophni went in and they messed with the sacredness of the offerings and the altars. They committed fornication in front of the temple doors and the people's hearts failed them. They were also seduced by the worship of other gods. They were in the midst of the land and they watched other people worship their gods. And these gods or the worship of these gods entailed perverted sexual expression. The main theme of these, this worship was sexual perversion and also indulging in materialism. 
and it attracted the minds of the people and because the leadership was not clear, they were easily seduced away into strange worship. At this particular time, the, the, the Bible says that the Philistines, who were the seafaring people, were now coming inland. They wanted land. They wanted property. And so they became a constant threat to the nation of Israel. And when the spiritual tide is low, it affects the economy. It affects us politically. And therefore, they were ripe and ready to be overtaken and oppressed by the Philistines. The Bible says that Israel decided to fight against the Philistines. We will go up and fight against them to preserve the land. But they lacked the power, the initiative, because they had become a beaten people spiritually. And the Bible said that the Philistines came and 4,000 men died. And they had the nerve to turn around and say to the Lord, why did you allow the Philistines to attack us? Why did you allow them to whip us? And then they backed up and said, well, maybe if we just get God to give us a little favor. It's called being churchy. It's called knowing how to manipulate your religiosity to get God to work for you. In the world, it's called magic. Somebody say magic. And that's all we try to do in Pentecost now is play magic. Oh, we know how to fast and we know how to wave our hands and we know how to use a churchy jerk because we think this thing is magic. Tell somebody it ain't magic, honey. Either it's God or it's not God. So they decided that since we are in trouble as a nation, we're in trouble as a people, we went up to defend ourselves and to protect our land. And trust me, the bottom line is always economics, property, money, gold, silver. And because part of the promise has to do with land, the children of Israel knew that if their land were taken, the promise would be taken. So they fought to protect their promise. But they lost because you can't have the promise without the promise giver. And we try to play that game. We want him when we need something. When we get him, we want to forget him. And the Bible said they decided to play this little churchy today, churchy games. Try to bend God's hand. Try to use magic. Try to use rituals. Try to use liturgics. Even though we're doing it, our hearts are far from him. But we know if we wave our hand a little bit, we'll get his attention. We try to barack and to heal her. We try to do all the things that we know that he inhabits the praises of his people. Oh, even though we know we ain't going to live right after we leave here. But we try to get his attention. And so they decided to get God's attention. Let's send to Shiloh where the Ark of the Covenant is. And let's bring it in the midst of our camp. For if the Ark of the Covenant is in the midst of our camp, then we know that God will save us. Oh, they knew how to talk it well. They knew how to say it well. The Ark of the Covenant was not God. It was a symbol of God's presence. It was a symbol of the imminent presence of God. That God is with us. He's here. He, he's, he's omnipresent. He's here, there, and everywhere. We can't contain him in a box. We can't contain him in a temple. We can't contain him in the universe. He's too high, you can't get over him. He's too low, you can't get under him. He's too wide, you can't get around him. But we can get close to him. I tell somebody, I just want to get close to him. I, I can't get over him. I can't get around him. But I can get close to him. They understood that if they got close to God, they would have safety, protection from the enemy. The Ark of the Covenant was an oblong box made out of shitting wood overlaid with gold. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant, you had Aaron's rod that budded to show that God can take a no good for nothing man and make him somebody. And then you had the tablets of the law to show that God says, thou shalt and thou shalt not. Then you had the pottage of manna to show that God can make a way out of no way. His name is still Jehovah Jireh. And then you had the lid. And on top of the lid it was sealed. And then you had the mercy seat where you sprinkled the blood to show that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. 
And right over the mercy seat you had the cherubim's win wings who were tipped together. And at the tipped wings you had the Shekinah known as the glory cloud which represent that God is here. He is very much here. He is close to us. If we get close to him and in his presence we will feel the nearness of his presence and the nearness of his touch. And they understood that when the ark was in the midst they were secure. Go up and get the ark. Go up and let God think that we want him with us. As a matter of fact, we want him with us, but we only want him with us because we want to whip the Philistines. And we only want him to whip the Philistines because we want to keep our land. Oh, come on, it's very logical.